And hello. <laughs> hello. Hey, hello. My name is James Fitzpatrick. I am a graduate of what is now known as the McAnally College of Liberal Arts and also a graduate of the School of Education. I am pleased to be here with two longtime friends and associates and colleagues to um, talk about a significant period in the history of Duquesne University. Uh, for any of us who were fortunate enough to be here in the decade of the 60s and the 70s during Duquesne's financial crisis, there are two indispensable individuals who were the originators and prime movers of a student effort to save the university, which was entitled The Third Alternative, Students to Save Duquesne. Dr. Rita Furco Joyce, who also holds a license in canon law, was president of what was then called the Student Congress, and Dr. Patrick Joyce was the chairman of the third alternative effort. Pat and Rita, thank you, what you for what you did decades ago for the university, and thank you for being part, an essential part, of this effort to perpetuate, explain, and pay tribute to the le legacy of Father Henry J. McAnally, the ninth president of Duquesne University. The seeds of the financial crisis coincide with Pittsburgh's renaissance of the 50s and the 60s. And what could have been the final blow was 1966 when the county commissioners announced the establishment of the community college system and also the University of Pittsburgh became state related. Duquesne's master plan had a price tag under Father McAnally's predecessor, Dr. Vernon Gallagher of $13 million, which grew to a whopping $46 million under Father McAnally. Father Mack, who took advantage of all the opportunities presented by the Urban Redevelopment Authority, particularly the Lower Hill Project and the Bluff Street Renewal Project. $46 million is a lot of money in any era, but according to amortization.com, was $46 million in 1968 is now evaluated at $361,942,182. How did the two of you, and if there were others, <laughs> first learn of the financial crisis the university was facing? I'll, I'll take a stab at explaining the background a little bit, Jim. Um, when I was elected to um, the student government, to student congress, um, I followed in the footsteps of Gregory Lau, who was the immediate president before me. And there was a movement to give the students a seat on the administrative council, which was at the time, and I don't know what it's called today, but at that time, it was the, the uh, board that met weekly and um, discussed whatever the problems of the university were. And um, it was a consultation with the vice presidents, with the university chaplain. The students and the faculty at the same time strove to get a seat on that board. And it was granted in the last, probably the last month or the last three weeks of Gregory Lau's administration as president. So I got to walk into the administrative board as a representative of student government because it was then three weeks old. Uh, as the board began to get comfortable with the situation of having the faculty and the students there, and the faculty representative was the president of the faculty senate, um, they began to discuss the finances of the, of the university. And it turned out that they were pretty dire at the time. Um, we can get into uh, Father Mack's uh, explanation of what that was at a later point in our conversation. but. How we first found out is that they laid out the situation with a problem and um, the budget committee of the university, um, by virtue of the fact that the students were on the administrative council, also had a student on the budget committee of the university. That happened to be Pat Joyce. And that's where I come in on And Yes. Um, I was the chair of the budget committee of student government, and as, as that position, I was put on the b budget committee of the university. Uh, that's when we first learned that there was a major problem, that the university's administrative council and the budget committee came together with Father McAnulty, and he said, we have 
a serious crisis on our hands. Um, and he outlined the problem, and the problem was immense, but it was immediate. And uh, essentially, he told us that we were running short of cash. The state of Pennsylvania had not paid its bills um, for more than half a year which meant that the student scholarships that the, the, the Duquesne students were receiving weren't being paid to Duquesne. The problem was uh, immense and immediate, a cash flow problem that could lead to uh, insolvency, not being able to pay the bills. And so that's when Father McInerney said to the committee, um, we have two alternatives. We can raise tuition in the middle of the year or we can close our doors. That's that simple. And the bottom line was they asked us to think about it and come back within two weeks uh, with if we would vote on a what recommendation to the president and the board. And they didn't specifically say to the students, think about it. They said to the vice presidents of the university, we have to come to some decision in the next two weeks. And you were both present for that? Well, I was in to certain meetings, but Pat was present for that, that particular meeting. That particular meeting. meeting was a budget meeting. Yeah. They provided us with two alternatives that we had to think about and come back and, and discuss uh, and resolve. And so immediately following that meeting, I went back to this building, uh, down to the first floor where the student government office was, um, and we called some students' friends together. They're always in and out. Yeah, yeah it was one of those uh, rooms that had the glass windows just like the room that we're in now. And so... Students were always walking past, and student government people were always dropping in and becoming involved in whatever conversation was going on. But, so the gist of this was that um, Pat came back stunned. I happened to be in the office. Several other of the officers happened to be in the office. We sat down and started discussing it. Other people were walking by the door, other students, and came in and said, hey, what's going on? You know, why are you talking? What, what, what's happening? So we began a conversation that must have continued the remainder of the afternoon. Here, I'd like to show you this. Uh. This is the button that I wore. Basically, it says, if you are not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And that's the attitude that the student government took yeah. to this crisis. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I echo that because it was, well, what are we going to do? We have to come up with something. So we sat there and we talked about it. And we came up with the fact that we needed to offer to do something. We would raise money. Well, that leads to the next question. How did you come up with the idea of trying to rally your fellow students to go out into the community, knock on the doors, and ask for support from the people of Pittsburgh and, Al and Allegheny County? Was it from that conversation? Well, yeah, but more than that. It, it, yeah, th that didn't lead to the going out right away. That led to two weeks of saying, how are we going to do, what, what shall we do? And what, what are we going to do? We have to provide a solution because we did not accept the fact that $200 is a significant amount to raise tuition in the middle of the year after they already been raised by $200. I know that sounds like a... Yeah, in today's today, dollars, but yeah. But it was a lot of money. Yeah. Go back to amortization, yeah, yeah, find yeah, out what that's yeah, worth. Yeah, yeah exactly. And yeah. We, that was an unpalatable alternative, and closing the doors was unacceptable. We just loved Duquesne. So we came up with a third alternative, and that was to, we would raise, Father McAuley said that they were, the, the banks would need a million dollars to to alleviate the, the, this crisis and allow Duquesne to continue to borrow and to move forward, um, pay the bills, um, until the state of Pennsylvania would start paying uh, the, the scholarships and providing more cash flow. So the million dollars target was what we brought back to the students, that we are short a million dollars and we'll pledge, let us see if Father McAuley would agree to tell the student body Tell the whole university what the situation is. How do we get into it? How are we going to get out of it? And we would provide an, off, an alternative, a third alternative. Sort of, did you have any qualms about how your fellow students would react to taking on what seemed to be an impossible, a, a million dollars, Rita, come on. Well, you know, sure we had some qualms, but, you know, when I think back to the era, 
it was, you know, the, the timing of this was 1970. It was a time of activism on all college campuses. And activism took many forms. It took a certain form in some places that ended up in a protest, and in other places, it took a different form. And in our situation, we felt that students would respond favorably. We didn't know how many. Of course we didn't know how many. But Pat had an excellent point at that time that you know, they have to know what we know. We can't possibly just say, we're going to raise money and not explain to them how the university got here. Because students were going to ask questions. Well, what do you mean? You know, raise tuition? We just raised tuition $200. We can't do that again. And what do you mean the university isn't paying the bills? So, you know, Pat's idea, it's your, you know, your part well, of the explanation. Well, it, 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 yeah. it, it was about five or six of us sitting in the, in the student union office, um, the student government office, and brainstorming together, we came up with an idea. Let's tell Father McAnulty that we will try to raise the money if he opens up to the students and the faculty and the university and just tells how we got into this situation, and we can then propose as students a temporary solution of how we can get out of it. And we yeah, all and agreed. of course, at that time, we had no, in our minds, we didn't have a structure. You know, this was just the very, very beginning, the very, yes, we're going to do something. We're going to help solve this problem. <laughs> Naivete of you, what have you, I don't know. <laughs> so we, we decided to go over and present that that night, the day of the, the budget meeting, that we heard this. So six, seven hours later, um, I think it was nine o'clock at night. Um, <laughs> it was dark. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 We're getting dark. Yeah, and it was, it's scary to go to Trinity Hall. <laughs> we, we, well, we, it was off limits back then. Sure, yeah. sure. So students were not allowed on Trinity Hall campus grounds. It was a private lo residence for the Holy Ghost Fathers, the, the uh, Spiritans. <clears throat> so Reed and I were designated to, go, and and, and I, oh, there were there were six of us. So I think that. All five or six of us in varying forms went over to And we Trinity rang Hall. The, the doorbell. <laughs> and it was dark in the hallway, dark. And the light came on, and Father Loritis, who is vice president for university relations, mm. he came out, and he was looking through the wind door, and he opened the door and said, yes. And we said, we'd like to speak with the president, Father McElroy. And Father Loritis, of course, knew at least do our faces because it had been at least a month or a month and a half that we had been on these boards at that point. And so he knew basically who we were. But very unusual to yes. have students <laughs> at the door at night. In the, if, if, we'd like to see the president, Father McAnally. And he said, do you have an appointment? And I said, we said, no. He said, uh, is he not expecting you? He said, no. And he said, Okay, just wait right here. He said, ushered us into a waiting room um, down the hallway, sat there, said, we'll be, ba be back. And about 10 minutes, 15, yeah, it was, yeah. It wasn't was, long. We hear this shuffling, <laughs> and it was Father McAnally, the president of the university, in his be bedtime <laughs> slippers. <laughs> You got him out of bed, I guess. And well, where he was working, but he had his slippers on anyway. <laughs> we sat in the room, and we said, we're concerned, Father, like we all are, but we have a proposal. Um, the student government would like to commit to you, to the university, to the community, to raise a million dollars. Well, he said, isn't that nice? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm paraphrasing because I don't know. I mean, yeah, I can't, I can't remember exactly but what he, he said he was, either. But he was yeah, at that time. not patronizing. He was warm as he always was. But he said, and, and how will you do that? And we said, I have no idea. <laughs> we have no idea, but we'll do a lot. We'll, we'll, we will we'll figure it out. But I think the way we can do that, Father, is if you told the whole university, what's the problem? 
how do we get here? And be honest with them, as you always are, but tell them the truth, and we'll propose a third alternative. And in order to do that, Father, you're going to have to cancel class because if we have this in the middle of the day, who's going to come if they're in the middle of class? So you have to agree that all classes will be suspended. You just said we'll propose a third alternative. Is that how you come up with the name, to just pop no. out? No, not no. yet. No, actually, yeah. we used the words but didn't know that that yeah. was the name. Yeah. We simply said, well, you know, because we had talked about the two alternatives we had, and we had to choose among them, or between them, and now we had to choose among the three. And, uh, but the point was that um, unless we had students, faculty, and staff together to hear this message, that it, we didn't think it could work. And, and he, we didn't tell them what it was about. And uh, Pat, we have that uh, poster there. But this was plastered all over this campus. This was the September one. Oh, that was the September one. But there was a very similar one for the April, the first one, that said all classes are canceled, um, including all activities. Come to the student union. Come to the ballroom and hear Father McAnulty give a presentation. He and he accepted right away. He agreed. He said, okay, yeah. let's give it a try. Uh, that was extraordinary. If you stop and think, students were protesting all over the country in all different ways and reasons. And gathering everybody together and telling everybody that we had a financial problem that might close the doors, um, who knows how that room could have erupted, how that room could have, you know, it could have been question and answer, question and answer, I, you know, it, it could have been negative. He agreed to give it a shot. That, that was a pivotal moment. Yeah, and Father explained it in great detail, laid out the situation to the students, and the, um, the reaction, I'm sure, was shocking. Like, how could this possibly be? How could this university uh, on this campus that looked nothing like it looks today. <laughs> so 53 years later, or uh, 54 years later, it looks vastly different. But um, I think that people were incredulous, like, how is that absolutely possible? But they listened respectfully. The next thing we did was that I talked and said, we don't know what the solution is, but we've got to have a solution, and we've got to help raise the money in some way. We don't know what we're going to do, but we're asking you to help. And the students in the ballroom reacted positively. Now, I can't say everyone in the ballroom <laughs> reacted positively, but it certainly seemed as if they did. When I was conducting my interviews and doing my research, I mean, he would beam, Father McEnany would beam when he talked about the third alternative. He's particularly proud of the two of you, but all the students who decided to rally around and try to save their university. Um, some of the people I talked to back then told me that there was a lot of um, advisors to Father McEnany, vice presidents, whoever, who thought it was not a good idea to reveal the financial problems to the sure. student body. Oh, I sure. guess they were. They were afraid of a, a panic or something. Um, obviously, that was sure, not the case. Sure, kids so. would leave. Students would leave, maybe. So I'm after sure he they feared. laid out what the financial problems were, after you got up and talked, and after you got up and said, by the way, we have this crazy idea that we're going to raise a million dollars, whether the idea was flushed out or not at that point, what was the reaction? Obviously, there wasn't a mass walkout, but what did the students do? Right after well, that meeting? they respectfully listened, and part of, um, obviously, it wasn't, Pat and Rita and Father McAnulty that were the only people involved in, his, in putting this assembly together. Um, it had the help of the professional staff of university relations. I don't know if it was called that at the time, but obviously the, um, those people that were in media, in communications said, this is a major thing. We have to call the newspapers. We have to call some kind of a press conference after this because this is going to be news. We are relating to the whole city the fact that we're in a financial crisis. 
And so we, we need to call people. We can't just do it here in a vacuum and expect that some kind of news is going to leak out. But we remember, need to tell them. Remember, the student government represented all facets of the university student body. So literally, student government was behind this. And the Inner Fraternity Council, the Inner Sorority Council, the ROTC, the business school. They all did get, get into it. They yes. all got yeah. people here. They all got people to come to the, to the assembly, spread the word, put up posters. This is a, a, a financial crisis. You've got to come to the ballroom and hear Father McAuley explain what the situation is. So literally, people showed up. Yeah, it was a crowded ballroom. And um, there was a press conference that was going to take place immediately afterwards. So we announced to the students that we were going to go upstairs, that Tom Sweeney, who was the vice president of student government, uh, student congress, myself, Pat, and father would all go upstairs, and we would tell the city of Pittsburgh and the region what it was that we had just told the students. But in the meantime, if you were willing to help, if you wanted to help, please sign your name in the back. There are tables in the back where representatives are going to be sitting at a table with more or less petitions, you know, just sign-up sheets. Please sign your name and how you can be contacted over the summer. Right. Because remember that this was April. And, of course, graduation was always early May, early to, right. you know, mid-May. So students were all going to be gone, and the campus was going to be empty, except for summer school. So how are we going to contact these people other than please give us your name, your contact information in the summer, and are you willing to help out? Are you willing to help out in the summer? Or if you're not available in the summer, are you willing to help out next year when we come back in September? And so we went upstairs and read in Father Mac. Father Mac did most of the talking right, at the press sure. conference. It was sure. about the, about the and university and about the financial situation. And that's, of course, what the media wanted. They wanted the sort of the bad story at the time, you know, like, what, what's the crisis all about? How did you get here? What was this all about? But they were re very receptive to the fact that the students had offered some solution, but what the solution was wasn't fleshed out yet. It and, wasn't and, and we there. agreed that uh, one of the, a couple of the students, our friends, Emmy O'Donnell, Mike McDonough, whatever, friends brought the petitions up as soon as they were signed. So in other words, get the signatures while we're upstairs and bring them up. And so in the middle of the press conference, M.A. O'Donnell brought the, brought the um, petitions and put them on the table in front. And she said there were more than 400 signatures of people who wanted to help within, within 20 minutes. Uh, that were willing to help over the summer. And you know, I have a memory. I don't have those petitions. I don't know where they are. I have a memory that it was more than 400. But Basically, some, we had a lot of people that were Somewhere along the line, I heard the number 700. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that uh, it, that was what was in my mind. 700. 700 was in my mind. And Pat said, oh, I think it was 400. But You're being <laughs> modest, Patrick. <laughs> memories, memories fade after a we, while. We just put the, put the signatures on the table. Yeah. Father McElroy blessed them and it became 700. <laughs> right. It's like the right. loaves and fish. The loaves and the fishes. <laughs> well, that had to make some kind of impact in the I, press conference. I think it, it did because it did. those people were very responsive. They were very responsive. And in fact, some of the people that were there not by coincidence, I think we're Duquesne alumni, you know, sure who came were. to cover the story. Bob James, yeah. God rest his yeah. soul, yeah. covered it. Um, and and the, the Al Donaldson. Al Donaldson, who wasn't the alum, but Post-Gazette, Post -Gazette, yeah. yeah. But anyway, there's so many people yeah. in the community who liked exactly. what they heard, and, and the media supported what the students were doing. One of the things I was going to ask you is about the era in which this took place, and because there was a time of student activism, activism mm -hmm. whether it was gender and race equality or the war, most notably mm -hmm. those three. And I think you've already answered this, but that was a help rather than a hindrance to what you were trying to pull off? Well, you know, I, I, I think that um, the activism part was what helped because um, I, I think that students of that era were so involved in so many things that when presented with an issue or a problem, it was um, it was a selfless response. Well, of course we have to help. 
of course we have to do something. And students were motivated, all different kinds of students. That was the interesting thing about this, this move or this drive on campus is that it involved not only those people that were already active in activities, you know, like the frater inner fraternity councils, the um, red mask, you know, the yeah, like yeah. Uh, all all of the organized groups, but it also involved people that weren't involved in anything, but who just said, "Sure, I'm going to come help." But it also involved the military groups. It also, you know, the like the. Um, the, the Rangers, Air. or Arnold Air Remember Society, Arnold the, Air. yes, right, right. Ranger Raiders. Yeah, those kinds yeah. of groups, you know. Yeah. I think that um, that was a good outlet for the times. It was the campus doing something, it was a rallying point. But that, that's not to say that, that students on campus didn't do those other things. I mean, there were rallies and marches going on in the hill that the students participated in too. For sure. You know, I, I remember being at, at those also. Um, I think that students at the time, you know, maybe they paid a little less attention to academics at the time. <laughs> I'm not sure, but you know, it, it was this time of activism and therefore they were involved in all kinds of things. We, we joke about the, the fact war. that in those times, you could put up a sign that said, rally tonight, 7.30. That's it. <laughs> rally tonight, 7.30. And people would show up. Right? But, but here's a, something, a, a, a corollary to your question. There were people who thought these were good kids mm. as opposed to those bad kids. Right. And we fought that, and we stood against that because we weren't good or bad kids. We were both. Yeah, we were everybody. You know, we, on campus, we, we, like a whole mixed bag. Our common yeah. cause was this university was worth saving, and that president was trustworthy, was believable, was someone that you could you could believe he was telling the truth, and we 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 loved him. I remember that there was a protest on campus. Uh, what was that, a sit-in? I don't know if right. Father talked about it when the one in the towers. Well, no, it wasn't in the towers. Oh, the towers it was wasn't in the even Union. Open yet. Yeah, the towers yeah. Wasn't open. Towers was just opening, but or just being built. But the protest was here on the sixth floor of the Union, and it was um, police carrying mace. The, that was okay. That was the source of it. The, the, okay, all right. They, they didn't want the police to carry mace. It was a weapon. <laughs> right. Right. Anyway, been. But we had some of the some of our best our good friends up there. But but the way that father handled that was so amazing. Yeah. You know, uh, he came, he met with them, he talked with them, he would go over and talk with them several times. I mean, this went on for a couple of days. This wasn't like, you know, one day for three hours and then they walked away and went home. I think that they even spent the night there. You know, it did go on for a couple of days, and father was just. He just knew how to deal with students. He knew how to deal with things. I mean, you know, did, did I, was it always wonderful dealing with students? No. I don't know. But. I got a story I got to share with you about Father McAnaldi and Harry the Mole. Harry the Mole? Harry the Mole. <laughs> this is a true story. I was a witness to it. And Harry the Mole is even in our yearbook. We know he exists. Yeah, there's a he picture of him in, in our, our yearbook. He was in our 1970 Harry, or 71 yearbook. Harry was a homeless yeah. man. Mm -hmm. who lived in the st steam tunnels underneath the, the academic walk. Everybody knew Harry. He would come up occasionally and, and bum a sandwich from somebody and go back in. I was here. The last streetcar that left downtown Pittsburgh to get home to Wilkinsburg, because I was a commuter, the last streetcar left at 1110. Um, I finished a Duke story I was writing, and I was out on academic walk, it was about 9, 30, 10 o'clock. I was getting ready to take, get, get my streetcar. And there's the president of the university sitting on the bench next to Harry the Mole. <laughs> Father McAuley and Harry the Mole are having this conversation. I let them have their peace. I walked around. Later on, I'm walking with Father McAuley down the walk, and I said, what were you talking about with Harry the Mole? And he said, 
state of the university? <laughs> he said, I said, tell me. He said, basically, he liked to sit. Harry knew the students. Harry knew that had the pulse of the campus. If something was going down, Harry knew about it. Um, this was an interesting conversation. This was the president of the university. I like to think, um, you know, when Jesus walked the earth, he talked with saints and sinners alike. Um, and Father McElroy, I said, why do you talk to him? He said, simply because um, it's a good source of information. And Harry is a good <laughs> It was <man>. his source. <laughs> yeah. Well, this, this is a man who could deal with students and yes. crown heads of Europe. And exactly. I, yeah, exactly. I, I was, you were telling that story about the sit-in, and I was here, and I was uh, thinking about the sit-in. This is nearly 70 years after the towers had opened, and something was going on, and there was a protest. And Father Mac got wind of it, puts on his coat, remember his, his, his fedora, hat, yes. and he walked down an academic walk, and saw this crowd of people who were all talking, and as soon as somebody was yeah. And so he walks in, he sits, he takes his coat off, he sits down on the floor, cross-legged. <laughs> What's this all about? And pretty soon the dozens or hundreds, whatever it was, of students left and a small group stayed with him because they were going to work out some kind of solution. When I was interviewing him for the dissertation, he talked about when all the construction was going on around here, he got this message that the Black Student Union wanted to meet with him. Didn't say why and all that, but they, they gave him a time and a place to be. Mm -hmm. And it was at night, and it was down in Rockwell Hall. And I don't know what Rockwell Hall looks like now, but you know, you had to walk down into the recesses to get oh, yes. to yeah, yes. sure. So all the lights were out, but they had these little votive candles lighting the way <laughs> that the path he was supposed to take. I don't, he didn't say this, but I don't know, maybe that was an intimidation factor. But anyway, he, he went, and he went to, into the room where he was told to go. And the leadership of the, the, the BSU were um, sitting there. And he said, hi, what, what's, what can I do for you? And all the construction was going on, and the, the black students had noticed that none of the contractors, subcontractors, were minorities. Ah, oh, mm, OK. And Father McAnally sat there kind of stunned from what, the way he described it to me. He said, you know, I never thought of that. I apologize. I never thought of that. Um, you know, we can't go in cancel contracts and fire people now, but we have other projects going on, and I will commit to you right here, right now, that we will have minority representation on it. And one young woman who was there said, how do I know we can trust you? <laughs> Father McInerney said, if I'm not keeping my word, you can call me back. So they never heard from him again on, on that particular issue. Sure. So he had that ability. Yes, he did. What gave him that ability was a, is a, is a mystery to me. I, I, I asked the questions over and over again, the question I would like to have asked Father Gallagher, with all the Holy Ghost priests at your command, because he was not only president of the university, he was also the uh, provincial of the Holy Ghost order. All the people with terminal degrees, all the people with mm -hmm. college administrative experience. Why Henry Mackinac? Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. He was a priest. He had a bachelor's degree. He went to... A, Serve in the, in the military. Right. He had no college experience outside of being a student. Why him? Of course, I couldn't ask him that question. Mm -hmm. But what was it about Mark McAnally? Because he told me, Father McAnally told me, when he was resisting coming back yes. here at Father yeah. Gallagher's request, he said, I only knew him slightly. So what was it? Um, I'll take a shot at that. Go right ahead. And I'll give you mine. <laughs> oh, please, I interrupted you. No, no. You first. Oh, sorry. I thought about this a lot. Um, he was the epitome of servant leader. It's one thing to lead. It's another thing to serve. Um, he understood both. He could make a decision, but he always spoke the truth. And Vernon Gallagher saw leadership in, in Harry Mackinac. Uh, I believe that with all my heart. And the other part of my answer is the Holy Spirit has a lot to do with this. Well, the question that also bugged me when I was doing this paper was, why is it that Chancellor Litchfield was sitting over a pit with about a $19 million debt, and you're sitting down here with a $46 million debt? Why couldn't Pitt make it work? Why were they threatening to close the doors? Why did they have to go state-related? Why couldn't they survive 
when you did, sitting down here in downtown, ben, downtown Pittsburgh with a 40 mile, and I shall never forget this. He leaned back, crossed his arms, looked up at the ceiling and said, it was the Holy Ghost. Okay. And what I said in other conversations, if, I suppose if I had been able to ask that question to Vernon Gallagher, I would have gotten the same answer. Mm -hmm. So when you say the Holy Spirit, I that's believe. where I was headed with this whole thing. Yeah, but I believe There is it. no reason in the world why Henry McAnally should have ended up president of a college. It just doesn't make any sense. Sure. He was the right man was, at the right time. At the right time. The right set of in skills. the yes. right set of circumstances. Mm -hmm. yeah, we've mm -hmm. often said mm -hmm. that this, the situation that occurred while we were students with the solution, a, a.k.a. the third alternative, could not have happened under a different person. It was Father, who, Father Mac who was so willing to give us a chance to try something. And he wasn't afraid to try it. Oh, he may have been. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't expose his fear to us. He certainly let us go. And he was there every step of the way. Everything we did, Father was there. Oh, just so supportive of all the student effort. Well, obviously he trusted his students and he certainly yeah. trusted the student leadership. May I tell you another story well, here? Please. Father McAnally, Rita, and a man you probably remember as the assistant chaplain, Father P.J. McNally. Uh, do you remember him? I, I, I remember the name, but I'm not yeah. getting a visual in my head. Okay. Right. So, the curly haired guy. We're just, just there you go. Curly no, I'm getting a picture. Okay. <laughs> curly okay. hair. Okay. Yeah, good man. Where students are marching the length of a million one dollar bills laid end to end, 94.6 miles, a million six inch lengths, and that in a circumference around Pittsburgh as a line drawn right through Altoona, Pennsylvania. And you know, and it could have been any other place, but there were a couple people in the leadership that were from there. Annie, and Annie Peelmeyer. Annie Peelmeyer and, and Pat, Pat Joyce. Joyce. So and I said, well, I know Altoona. Huh? Are you really from Altoona? Altoona. That's where I he mean, was born, yeah. That's where I was born, but <laughs> lived in Wilkinsburg. Altoona to Pittsburgh, 94.6 miles, $1 million. So on the second full day, now this is 24 miles a day. I don't remember. 20, what okay, is Well, you would remember you were on the march. Right? 20, 24 miles a day. That's a lot of miles. Yeah. Four, four days in a row. So on the second day, we had just marched through rain and fog all day. We were exhausted. We were frustrated. It was dark. We were at, at two hours past our goal of getting to Blairsville at, to sleep overnight in, in a library of Blairsville Church. I forget. Anyway, the, we're coming up a, a, a major hill. There are many major hills in Altoona, or uh, on the way from Altoona. And in the fog and in the rain and in the dark, we are miserable and we are marching. We, uh, Lenny Fredericks, uh, Mike McDonough tell us, we've got another, uh, another mile and a half, two miles at the most. We've had our, uh, right here. Into the fog comes a car <laughs> and pulls, in, passes us and pulls next and backs up. It is Father McAnulty, the president of the university. Father McNally, the chaplain, assistant chaplain, and Rita, the president of student government. And Father McAnulty pulls out of his pocket a pint of brandy. <laughs> <laughs> St. Bernard sent him. That, exactly. That, <laughs> that's what they said. <laughs> and we all took a big swig or two and got a hug from the president. And we kept on. Yeah. I want to remark for me. You, you, obviously, you got support of Father McAnulty, and there's some off campus people who are really supportive of the university. When mm -hmm. I think of General Mellon giving exactly. him a couple of million dollars to build the science center. But what other kind of support did you get from people in the community, business leaders downtown, and how did you go about getting them on board with this? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking as you're telling the story about the march, and before I even address that, um, there was this, the, the publicity 
had gone from here through the press releases and then other newspapers picked it up. And so it, it then did eventually become somewhat of a national story. There were articles in the Wall Street Journal, in the New York Times. I mean, it, front page. Front, front page. page. Um, the magazine Life, I don't know if you remember Look and Life magazine. Okay. Oh, yeah, you're our age. <laughs> Poor <laughs> me remember that. <laughs> so in any case. I'm, I'm gonna, uh, thank you for that, by the way. It was a momentary lapse of thank you for that. <laughs> so Life magazine sent out two reporters, a photographer and a reporter, to do a story on the third alternative. I remember running out to the airport, borrowing someone's car because I didn't have a car on campus. So one of the one of the people, one of my roommates, in fact, had a car on campus, and so she loaned me the car, drove out to the airport to pick these guys up, bring them to campus. They met with several people on campus. They did they come out to the march to take your pictures? Oh, sure. Yes, they did. They did. I, I recall coming out the second day with those life reporters. <laughs> They even drove the Tammy bus out with some students to join us. Okay. So that reinforced the troops. Okay. But um, so they, they were going to do this wonderful story. And in fact, it was going to be about Duquesne, but it was also going to be about other colleges and universities and the kinds of situations that they're facing all across the country. We were so looking forward to the story. And then something earth shattering, uh, an amazing flood, T tsunami. a tsunami in, in Bangladesh right. took place. Oh. And yeah, that so was well. front page story, which bumped our story because there were too many other factors, you know, and there were so many other Never things. Never go back that to they, it, yeah. we missed it. But, yeah. but, but the point is there were it, stories around the country. But, you know, so, so that's kind of a prelude to Talk about the, how did other people get unions, involved? The labor unions. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, many of Duquesne students were first generation college. Sure. Many of us were commuters. Many of us came from working class families, labor unions. And the labor unions, the Teamsters, the laundry workers, the steel workers, all committed to raise money for the third alternative. Which was just amazing. You know, I, it, and that came not by us knowing them and calling them and saying, would you come to campus and meet with us? That came from alumni. Well, alumni came onto this campaign so willingly and excitingly. I mean, several names, like Mossy Murphy comes to mind, it, you know, the, the great cheerleader of Duquesne sports. Uh, Mossy was a very um, connected individual who brought those labor union people to our door. and. They held a, um, a, a, a a cocktail party, a cocktail reception. Right up in the faculty dining room. In, right, it, what used to be the faculty dining room. Yeah. And um, that brought in several thousands of dollars of people coming and supporting the university through his efforts. But there were a lot of alumni that, uh, that helped out, and then their connections then fanned out. So... I think that it multiplied itself, you know, because they worked in different places. We had um, Larry Werner, who came up with the design of the third alternative. Well, one of our classmates, well, a year ahead of us, Lorraine Bernitsky, Heidekett, um, was doing her senior year internship in journalism. And she was assigned to the Ketchum, uh, McLeod, and Grove pub, uh, advertising agency. Um, pub, okay. They probably do pub, things, pub, other things, too. Yeah, yeah, and advertising. Yeah. The point is, the president of that organization, Larry Werner, and Lorraine Bernetsky committed that organization to give us their assistance. And they were the ones that came up with the bumper stickers and the billboards and the, the bus ads, the buttons, um, the themes, the radio ads. I mean, we brainstormed these. We brainstormed them with these professionals in the room with yeah. Lorraine and with Larry Werner and Mossy Murphy and the students and came up with these things and then they were the ones that designed the logo. That wasn't us that designed it. And, and you know, they designed it. They came and to us with... Contributed services. Yeah. yeah. They came yeah. Well, that's invaluable. A yes. hundred billboards around the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, and you had that light on the, the south uh, side. The light up on the Mount help, Washington. Help, Washington, yeah. It help DU. Help Duquesne, Duquesne U. Duquesne U. Help Duquesne U. And it was the Alcoa sign. Yeah. 
it was Alcoa at the time, and Alcoa loaned their sign and changed that lettering to help Duquesne U. Um, Remember that? Yeah. yeah. Amazing. But, you know, by the time we came back in September, these things were done. You know, the, the bus ads were done, the, I mean, like the designs for them. Yeah. And when we met with the students in September, uh, and that was the it, second, the second meeting here, the uh, we had people from the community attend that, that rally, that, that, um, that meeting in the ballroom. So we had the mayor of the city, we had the county commissioner, we had uh, all kinds of alumni attend, several other business people. And passing the story from them to others continued to generate excitement about this project. And Father Mac was always willing to be there, to be every step of the way in exactly what was going on with this project. Now, now we had, by the time this story happens, we had raised something like $300,000. It, it was the fall of 70. Um, 70. 70. 70. Fall, the fall of 70. Right. And Father McInerney called us. And we went up to see him, and he said, I've got really good news. The Mellon Foundation wants to meet with you. The Richard King Mellon Foundation, the largest foundation in Pittsburgh and one of the greatest foundations in the country. Now, this was after General Mellon had given the money for the no, science office. No, it was oh, not yes. no. Oh, no, oh no, after the science yes. building. Oh, right. I'm sorry. Yeah, after the after yes. they had given the money for the science yes. center. This is three years later, four years later, maybe. I don't know. But this is in response to what's going on in the crisis and in response to the student fundraising. So Father McEnany said that Richard King Mellon Foundation wants to meet with the two of you guys. So um, go and see and tell them their story. <laughs> and I remember that the development professionals were saying, now look, kids, don't ask for anything. <laughs> don't ask them. Don't make any kind of pitch. Just tell them the story about what's going on. And don't ask. Actually, <laughs> I, my honest memory is that Father Mack only said that to, to I, us. Well, I also remember the, okay. the like right. Paul McWilliams being there. But, but so, anyway. so obviously they are professionals and they've dealt yeah. with the Mellon Foundation and they know what to do. They said, just tell them your story. and Tell them what you're mm -hmm. doing and why you're doing it. And that's all we did. So we went and there were whew, Lots five of, of the most powerful <laughs> white men, God love them, in <laughs> all of the region. And they're sitting there listening to our story. And they're asking us questions about motivation and about um, student attitudes and about whether we were the, they didn't use these words, but, but were, were these as good kids or that we the, or, you know, were they were not the good kids, the bad kids were left. And we talked about who all was representing us, you know, the fact that there were all the students involved in this and not just the good kids, the, the, the ones who wouldn't protest. Um, so at the end of the conversation, Mr. Joe Hughes, who is the chair of the foundation, who has all the power in Pittsburgh rolled into one, he says very grandfatherly, how can we help you? And Rita and I looked at each other. <laughs> like, uh-oh, what do we do now? <laughs> yeah. Rita and I looked at each other. And I know we weren't supposed to ask for anything. So I reached my pocket, and I pulled out a, a raffle book. of. The, I said, we're having a raffle. <laughs> the prize is, is, is a four-year scholarship to Duquesne, worth $10,000. Um, it's only a dollar chance, and it's $5 a book. And... Um, Every one of the men said, I'll take a book. And they all reached into their wallets and found that nobody had any cash. None of the Mellon Foundation men had cash. Yeah, who needed cash, right. They didn't need cash. <laughs> they didn't need cash, right. So all I can remember saying was, that's OK. We passed out the book yeah. to them, and we said, you're good for it. Yeah. <laughs> so they all got off the hook with giving about $30, and then right. off you Right. They gave nothing. But yeah, they, well, the but, they, line, but we left for half a book. <laughs> but about, about, about uh, uh, three weeks later, I think, we heard from Father McElroy that, that they had pledged $1 million 
if you raise your million. Yeah, a challenge grant. Challenge grant. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I can say yeah, as a fundraiser for 45 years, that was the easiest remainder to ever raise because mm -hmm. the entire community got behind the Mellon Foundation. Literally, uh, over the transom, one person gave anonymously $91,600 worth of stock, and that just started to roll in. Yeah, so it wasn't all small gifts then. At that point in time, we did get bigger bigger. So gifts. you had the canvassing of the neighborhood. Yes. You had the support from folks downtown, foundations. You had the support of the student unions. What other fundraising activities were there as part of this whole effort? Oh, we, <laughs> we did things that, uh, like concerts in the Rat Skeller. Um, Raised like $175. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> you know, we did. But I mean, they were, that? yes, exactly. That was what the theory was. So whoever was in charge of entertainment, uh, the, the subcommittee that was in charge of uh, promotion of activities, got several groups to come in and play for us, you know, and the charged... Uh, 50 cents admission, whatever it is that the, you know, the students could bear at the time. We, we had ideas that were wonderful and ideas that were duds. Uh, but the fact was everybody on campus had their own way of, the Inner Fraternity Council, Inner Sorority Council, they had oh, their they own. Oh, they all had their own fundraisers too, yeah. Uh, yeah. And you conducted a phonathon. Oh, that phonathon. Well, the phonathon, phonathon was the first. first thing we did to get some recognition and cash before we came back in September to show people that we had we've been serious and we're doing so we raised the first phonathon that Duquesne ever had. And it was in this the the, the Africa room now, yeah. that's what it's called. It was called the Duquesne room at the time. And we put in twenty phones and we spent uh, ten nights calling and we raised sixty one thousand dollars. Which was a lot of money. Yes. And yeah, it was, the, it, then it was, and a lot it of was money. the first time we that the university reached out by phone to its alumni. See what you started? You get telephone calls all the time. <laughs> so, all told, yes, you with, the, with the canvassing, the raffles, the phonathon, the matching grants, mm -hmm. the support you got, what was your final result? Monetarily? Monetarily. You know, I, th I think I saw numbers like, you know, 1.389 or something like that. I mean, that, that's a number that sticks in my head, but I'm not sure of the exact total, I don't think it was important that we ever found it out because we knew it was successful at that point and the university then was handling the collections at that point. I mean, like, people weren't Here, coming in and handing us checks for $100,000. They were handing that to the Paul, university. Paul McWilliams told me, and they, there was a final report on once the Mellon Foundation gave her their million challenge and the entire university was involved, um, it was two point three million dollars. Two point three. Okay. In in the end, in after, the end, after you know, like in, in, a snowballing yeah. after our effort, and, you yeah. know, that was like was part of the whole right unified effort. Right. Now, with the benefit of hindsight, and it's been as we sit here more than fifty years since this whole thing happened. Mm. When you look back on that, what are your thoughts? You know, just, the, the, it was an amazing time. But I don't know that any other time for Duquesne it could have happened. You know, that was like the, that you know, what's that, that book and film, The Perfect Storm? You yeah. know, everything came together <laughs> at one time. Yeah, with you better know, results. With, yeah, yeah, yeah. So for Duquesne, yeah. it was a perfect storm with good results. You're right. Yeah, it was... The state of Pennsylvania, so many students had those PHEAA loans, you know, the fee loans. Mm -hmm. well, isn't yeah, that what they were called? I had one. I mean, it wasn't a loan. It was a scholarship in quotation marks where, you know, they were need-based, but they were a little bit of brains-based. <laughs> and so, you know, students graduating from high school got those scholarships, and lots of Duquesne students had them because this was a working-class university at that time. It was the right place, the right time, the right people, the right, right set of circumstances. All things came together so neatly and yeah. so nicely in a very, very, very difficult period of time. Yeah. The, the motto of the university, Spiritans, is the, it is the spirit that gives life. And without a doubt, um, this was spirit-infused. 
um, and uh, you had a, a leader in Father McInerney who had all of the humility, as I said before, of a servant leader. Um, and he taught us the, the, the way of humility, truth, um, and self-inspired, do it, get, get it done. You know, and what was really amazing is his willingness, and it had to be his leadership too, that allowed students and faculty to initially hear about the problem by allowing our entrance into the inner sanctum of the university. You know, the, who was doing that then? Who was allowing students and faculty to be part of, uh, you know, it wasn't decision making, but we were there to hear it and to offer comment. Oh, offer input. Yeah, and. I, I have one, one final story that is a personal story, but it's about McInerney. Is this a time I can do it? Yeah. It was one of those late nights after the Duke I, deadline. I got my f story filed, and I was walking on on campus, and I ran into the president one more time, and we just walked together, just walked, talked. And he, I don't know if you knew, he had arthritis in his fingers, mm -hmm. and and his <laughs> fingers were all crooked. I remember that? And he he pointed his little crooked <laughs> finger at me, and he said. So, how is it with you and Rita Furco? I said, uh, great, why? Why do you ask? No, I'm just curious. Uh, he said, um, are you a couple, a thing? Uh, I don't know what the word he was. I, don't know what, I said, what do you mean? He said, I see someday maybe the two of you would marry. <laughs> and I, I looked at you him like... You weren't even dating at the time. Was that right? no, not, really. not really. Not really. College friends. Not really. We, we, we were good friends. A, a yeah, we had, dance. Yeah, right. right. I had to invite somebody to <laughs> a sorority dance. So I had I to invite Patrick. somebody. No, no, no. So, <laughs> all right. That was my dear friend. Yes, of course. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 no, Father. We're just friends. Oh, he said. Okay. And he winked at me with his crooked little finger. <laughs> and I'll never forget, that was the first time that... A man who, uh, you know, he was like, a, he was, there's what's Alma Potter. Uh, 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 not Alma Mater, but Alma Potter. Potter. Yeah. I said, uh, he raised the issue. And anyway, so you ask, looking back over 50 some years, we've been married 51 years almost. Um, and it's been a beautiful life. Uh, we're gr grateful for that man mm -hmm. and for his leadership and for his touching our lives. And Absolutely. You know, in you talked, Jim, about how he was a mentor but also a hero, and truly he was my hero. Amazing, amazing man. Well, that brings me to, I guess, to my next question because this documentary was suggested to perpetuate the memory and the legacy of Father Henry J. McAnally, who was a friend, mentor, and hero to, uh, to many of us. I mean, he influenced my career for, for mm -hmm. sure as I was an undeclared student. I think that's fallen out of favor right now, but <laughs> it was getting to know Father Mac and getting to know the Dean of Students sure, here that sure, sure. kind of got me on. Um, but it was also to inform people who didn't know him or weren't members of the Duquesne community um, who might view this thing of the significance of his presidency. You know, but the history of Duquesne could have ended in the decade of the 60s had it not been for you and the people who rallied to the support um, what would you like the people who are going to be viewing this documentary to take away with them? You first. You know, a, amazing man, amazing time. Um, the word that I the the words that I put together before about the perfect storm. Um, I would like people to know what a remarkable man he was and what legacy he left to Duquesne. I mean, just look at the campus, and yes, it's been built up by subsequent presidents, but without his vision to start the towers, without his vision to build College Hall, without his building Mellon Hall, where would we be today? Those are three um, 
anchors for the campus among the newer buildings that you know have been built in subsequent years. I mean, he was the architect of the campus in many ways. I mean, certainly Father Vernon Gallagher started the idea, but it was Father Mack who executed it in many ways. And yes, sure, this beautiful campus that I'm looking at today out the windows is not Father Mack. It's, um, you know, it's, it's Dr. Gormley, it's Dr. Doherty, it's Dr. Murphy, or uh, Murray. Uh, it's all those people that came after him but without his laying the seat, you know, planting those original big buildings, those anchor buildings, where would we be? I think three takeaways from that era 50 some years ago speak to today as well as tomorrow. Speak the truth in humility, and trust in the Holy Spirit. That, I think, is the beauty of Duquesne and sets us apart from other institutions. And if we use those three that Father McAnulty taught us, truth, humility, and the Spirit, I think we'll do all right. When uh, Father Gallagher and Willard Rockwell were putting together their um, their campus master mm -hmm. plan. They, he deliberately put Assumption Hall where it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he thought it was our destiny to get all that property. Yeah, and I yeah. don't know that even the Pittsburgh Renaissance effort was on the way. But with the Bluff Street Renewal Project, you know, they came to Father McEnany and he used to talk about how he got $10 million worth of property for $900,000. Yeah. So it was our destiny to, yeah. to take advantage of that. And he didn't have a crystal ball to see what was going to go on in the county or what was going to go on with the sure. University of Pittsburgh. And he had to take these risks because um, when he was forced to come back here, he said he looked out his window, and, do you want to preside over this blighted area? And he said, no, I want my students, I want my faculty and my staff to have beautiful surroundings because people respond to their surroundings and I want them to be proud of where they go to school, where they eat, or where they live, where they work. And so all this was a necessity. You know, it could have all come, all come crashing down, but I got to wonder now, the two of you who were so instrumental in saving this place and rallying your students to help you do that, when you take a look around now, because you talked about the buildings on it, but the programs have been started through other presidents, and including, for God's sakes, a medical school. And Rita and I got to see yeah. the facility. Uh, yeah, last week. Last week. Yeah. And do you ever sit back and think of what your role is in the very idea that this place still exists? You know, uh, I'm involved in the university still, so I'm, I'm here through the alumni board coming to campus frequently, and it just brings such a sense of peace. Um, but it has amazement. to bring you a sense of pride, too, for goodness well, sakes, the but, two of you. But peace also, because I think, wow, all these kids are up here. <laughs> I don't want to get emotional about it, but, you know, <laughs> all these people are here today, and they wouldn't have been. They might not have been. Well, I've heard the emotion in your voice and, and yours. When I was thinking of these questions and, and, and writing mm -hmm. some things, you know, I, I started to get emotional, too. How could you not given the time that we were all here, yeah, given yeah. the extraordinary person that we all got to know and love yeah. and, and considered our friends, when I think of my being a student of his sure. and then my being a staff member of his and then my being a researcher of his and then I would like to say a friend of his. Um, yeah. And, you know, how he influenced me in my career. But you, Pat, take a look around, see what you're responsible for helping these Here's what Men makes do. me especially proud, is that the students of today, um, like Hannah, a journalism student, who's working behind the scenes on this video, um, like so many others, the message that is carried on generation to generation remains similar. Not the same, but similar. Like, for example, you mentioned the 
Osteopathic School of Medicine. Duquesne's mission for that school inspires me because it's providing medical service in where the, it is most needed, not for plastic surgeons who want to fix and make people beautiful. Or This is people who are providing basic health care in rural and underprivileged, underserved populations. Uh, that's what Duquesne is standing for today. And that's what he stood for and what every president since then has stood for. Um, and keeping, not just keeping an institution alive, but keeping those spirit and values alive that carry on generation to generation, they go out and serve. And that is worth all, as my mother would say, all the tea in China. You know, the um, Dr. Kaufman, who's the dean of the medical school, right. was telling us that part of their um, curriculum is that, you know, they attend school and then they go on mission trips as all part of what they're supposed to do um, in the United States, of course, but also in other places. And he introduced us to a faculty member who is a doctor also, um, and he's their IT person. And he comes from a village in Tanzania where the Spiritans are. And the Spiritans um, provide the you know, spiritual ministry to his community. His father is a chief there, is the chief of the tribe. And the, the medical students are going to go to that particular village as one of the mission trips. Uh, you know, to go to your point, that's, that's absolutely remarkable. And uh, uh, yes, a real sense of pride. Absolutely. You know, when you think about that. Yeah. Our university had its origins in the liberal arts, um, its founding college. It remains today an institution very much grounded in liberal arts. And the university has chosen to name the college and the graduate school of the Rocks over its most distinguished graduate and our most significant leader. And reflecting on your lives and your careers, how has your liberal arts education impacted that? The, the humanities, the liberal arts uh, soars. Um, in that I, I learned philosophy, theology, ethics, um, I, 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 poetry. Um, the, I, I, I hate, I'm, I'm wrestling with the word higher, but the higher values to me are something that is above the self-serving. It's, it's above um, my own personal wants and needs. It, 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 it expands, all those studies in humanities allows you to expand your vision from beyond your inner self to others and those in, in far greater need than, than you might be. I have been to Chimbote, Peru, a fishing village um, 4,000 miles straight south where the Pacific Ocean meets South America. There's a mission hospital there that I have been supporting of. And in fact, I was privileged to raise money to build a mission uh, hospital clinic that serves 1,000, 1,100 patients a day. Uh, ba babies are born in our maternity hospital. Um, we've b birthed more than 100,000 over 50 years. My humanities degree from Duquesne University, the McAnally College, um, helps me appreciate why that's important for us to, to be present there and to serve. I have given a talk on the north side at Troy Hill about that mission hospital. And a gentleman confronted me after that talk with his finger in my nose and said, well, you're doing nice work. Good, that's great. But look around here on the north side. There's plenty of poor people. Why do you have to send them our money down to 4,000 miles south? And I said, do you have a toilet 
that flushes? Do you have a roof that keeps the rain off your head? Do you have heat, central heat here in your poor house? I'm not saying you're not poor. I'm not. I'm saying we're all poor in some way. Uh, our, the humanities has helped us to find where that is and serve it, whether it's in Troy Hill or Chimboti, Peru. And I give credit to this university and that, those, that field of studies for that. Nicely said. Yes, very nicely said. <laughs> uh, for my part, um, the pride I have in my liberal arts degree is that it didn't teach me a craft. You know, it, it didn't say, this is what you're going to do and go out and get a job tomorrow doing this particular craft. It gave me a skill of thinking and processing that, um, you know, I'm not saying it as eloquently as Pat, but um, it gives you a methodology of thinking and handling a problem and coming up with a solution, and it opens the door to a vast number of careers. Um, I finished uh, my, uh, well, I guess I didn't finish it. No, one, uh, one of my degrees here was from the law school, and um, that's a place where you also, you, you don't necessarily learn law, you learn a method of thinking, you learn a process of analyzing. And law school admissions then were said to not so much look at the mechanics of things, but uh, look to thinking processes, like look to the liberal arts, look to those candidates that know how to write, that were taught English and know how to write that know how to think, that know philosophy, also by all means at a Catholic university that know theology. And so I'm absolutely grateful for the experience of the liberal arts. I, I can't envision myself, uh, I, I did have some classes in, in other schools and you know the great um, class in education, uh, that was great, that was fun. Um, the same thing with a business class that I had. but. My heart was with the liberal arts because it's what gave me my foundation to do what I do today as a thinking human being. Well, I went into the liberal arts because I, the reason I went to college is because my mother told me I was going to college. Not mm -hmm. why, not mm -hmm. anything to necessarily to study or even where to go, just you're going to college. Yeah. You know, yeah. A good son does what his mother tells him to do. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, fortunately, I found Madeline Huck, God rest her soul, oh, oh, yeah. yes. academic advisor. and Yeah. Probably for the better part of the first year, if not a year and a half, she kept talking me out of dropping out of school. But I have never for a moment ever regretted not going to one of the professional schools, but having mm -hmm. a liberal arts education. And I've spent 40 years talking to my students about the value of a liberal arts education, about how we are adaptable. When you get a job, they're gonna train you to do the things the mm -hmm. way they want you to do and all that. But when you get that foundation in the liberal arts, and I use this example, I don't want to give too many details away in case he ever sees this, but um, <laughs> I had a friend who was a major in one of the professional schools right, in, in pharmacy, mm -hmm. and who used to make fun of the fact that we were reading novels or poetry uh -huh. or taking a philosophy course. I mean, everybody has yeah. their foundation in the liberal arts, but then they go on to take their professional classes. So a bunch of us decided that we were going to get together and go down to the Jersey Shore. We hadn't seen each other four or five, whatever it was, years. And as you go to the shore, you know, you take your lounge chair, you take your sun guard, and you take a trashy novel to read. <laughs> so we're, we're walking down to the beach. I don't know what trashy novel I had, but I looked over, and I did a double take. He was carrying a copy of Arthur Miller play, uh, the, the Crucible. Okay. Well. And I said, that's hardly light beach reading. Yeah. Well, he went off and he got his job, not in, in a pharmacy, but in the pharmaceutical industry. And after they were done doing whatever kind of business they were, he was having to go out to dinner with clients. And they wanted to talk <laughs> politics, they wanted to yeah. talk history, they wanted to talk yeah. art, they wanted to talk literature, because they weren't as scientifically yeah. <laughs> oriented. He had to put himself in a master's of the arts program to play catch up to the things he used to make fun of me for having to do. Mm. So. Never, ever, ever underestimate yeah. the value of a yeah. liberal arts education. And here we are, three very mm -hmm. proud graduates of what is now called the McAnulty College and Graduate School of Liberal Arts. And yeah. wouldn't trade a moment of that for anything. Exactly. Well, I, I can't tell you how 
grateful I am for the two of you for taking the time to walk down memory lane and, <laughs> and, yes. and, yeah. and to fill us in on all the wonderful experiences you had as an undergraduate and the extraordinary opportunity that you grabbed by the throat and, and, <laughs> and, 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 and did what you did for this place. I would like to thank you because sincerely you committed your doctoral dissertation to capture and mm -hmm. record for history the McAnulty years of Duquesne University. And that doctoral dissertation is worth reading, worth, it's worth keeping. Uh, I'm grateful that I have a copy that you gave us, um, autographed to us as a friend. But it's a story that's worth preserving, and you did it well. Thank you. Thank you. Very first question I got in my defense, which 30 years ago last month, um, huh. I was the associate dean of the graduate school of education at the University of Pittsburgh. And the very first question he said, what did you enjoy most about your research? And I must have got the smile one from ear to ear. And I said, I got to spend a lot of time with my friend, Father McAnulty. And yeah. we did. He took so much time out of his day to not only to, to answer questions, but then to authenticate wow. everything. Yeah. What a gift. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what a gift it was to be able to spend that time with yeah. him. Yeah. Yeah. But um, it's also kind of moving and, and yeah. meaningful to sit here with the two people that when I came here as a freshman, I wanted to be. <laughs> Yeah, you know, these two people who are wrapped up in this thing I didn't quite understand, but you were also student mm. congress president. You were the big man on campus. Everybody knew who Pat, Pat Joyce was, and I said, I want to be them someday. Mm. So thank you for being role models and inspirations. Thank you for what you did 50-some years ago, and thank you for what you did today, because you two, both of you are truly one in a million. Thank you. <laughs>